Welcome to Gamecock Pod Live. For the next three to four years, I'll be committed to the University of Okay, uh, This is Rogers again to the 25, 20, 15, 10. Rogers scores! Oh, the is done! Oh, South Carolina is sending shockwaves through the SEC. Where's it at the buzzer? That's a win! Unbelievable! I don't believe it! And now, live from Studio 54 of the Gamecock Pod Studios, here's the cockfather himself, Keith Alsep. All right, everybody, happy new year. It is 2024, the year of our Lord Jesus Christ. Happy new year. I hope everyone had a great holiday season. Uh, Whichever holiday you celebrated, whether it was Christmas, Hanukkah, Kwanzaa, all of the above, none of the above, happy new year. Welcome back into Gamecock Pod Live for January the 3rd, 2024, episode number 1383. It's been almost two weeks since uh, we have been around, well, exactly two weeks since our last show on National Signing Day, which was a great day. For Shane Beamer and the Gamecocks, I've got a lot to catch you up on in our news, notes, and headlines brought to you by our good friends at BP Skinner Clothiers located at 1003 Gervais Street in the heart of the Vista at BP Skinner. They are building their reputation on the perfect fit of trust, quality, service, and style. And it is their privilege to provide you a professional and individualized wardrobe that creates a distinct style that identifies you. Excellence is their passion. They strive to make their quality and service as exceptional as the customer's in which they serve. Brent Skinner has been building relationships with clients for 17 years. He and his wife, Marlo, started this uh, business in 2012, now located in the heart of the Vista, along with Josh Colvin, who's always on the store floor when he's in town uh, or traveling nationwide as is Brent at times, servicing their customers. Whatever your clothing needs may be, whether it is a Gamecock line of clothing, like this beautiful Holderness and Born black pullover that I'm wearing, polos, caps, custom-made sport coats, blazers, dress shirts, uh, suits, socks, neckties, shoes, belts, accessories, whatever you need. Brent Skinner has got you covered at BP Skinner Clothiers in the heart of Columbia's historic Vista. When clothes off the rack just won't do or you've got a special occasion coming up, go and let Brent and Josh measure you up and design and fit something especially just for you. All right, the college football playoff took place on Monday. Wow. Uh, the four-team playoff was at its finest. Uh, long live the four-team playoff. 
but the four team playoff is dead. And wow, what a way to go out. Both games for the first time decided in overtime or on the final play of the game. Alabama and Michigan got it started off. Quite frankly, I thought Alabama was going to win this team uh, or win this game. I thought they would be the better team. Hats off to Jim Harbaugh and his offensive staff. I thought they exposed Kevin Steele and Travaris Robinson for being overrated and dead-ass average at best. Um, so that one was decided in overtime after Alabama really dominated the second half by attacking Michigan's perimeter on the defense. They have fourth and goal at the three after Michigan scored in overtime and they run a quarterback draw. Uh, if Milrow follows his guard outside, he probably scores. He stuck it up inside and got stuffed just like they did most every time they ran up the middle. Um, and so you're going to have an all Big Ten championship game coming up Monday night, January the 8th, as Washington and the guy that should have won the Heisman Trophy. <clears throat> okay. I mean, no doubt about it in my mind, Michael Penix Jr. was the best player in the country, is the best player in all of college football, and should have won the Heisman Trophy. They hold on thanks to some poor clock management that allowed Texas, they had an injury in the final minute, <clears throat> the clock stopped until the snap because they were under one minute. You have the option for the 10-second runoff. Um, obviously, uh, Texas didn't want that. They could have ran the clock all the way down. Texas ends up having time to go down the field. They get to the 12-yard line. But I said it, you can't trust Quinn Ewers. You look at it, Michael Penix Jr., 29 of 38 for 430 yards and two touchdowns. Quinn Ewers, 24 for 43, 318 yards. He also added 54 yards on the ground. And Texas was knocking on the door. They had four plays three or four plays from the 12-yard line and could not get it done. So Washington, along with Kalen DeBoer, who quite frankly, in my opinion, is the rising star in the coaching profession, okay? A better coach than Kirby Smart doesn't have the resources or the recruiting base to uh, recruit with those guys. But um, I love Kalen DeBoer. Loved him when he was Indiana's offensive coordinator. I thought Will Muschamp should have hired him. He hired Mike Bobo, which was a an excellent hire. Um, so, uh, Clint, I agree. Great to have so many of you watching and listening live. Great to see uh, Craig. My man, Arthur Williams, and my dude, Clint Morrison, who's from Pickens County, just like me, all in the chat, as well as others are. Jump in our Nana's Porch chat box, Carolina Titan. Great to see you as well. Um, you know, I, we can certainly debate. I thought Washington, they really didn't shock me. I picked them to win the game. I watched a lot of their games this past year. Um, 
I was worried about the physicality and if their defense could hold up, but then I forgot Texas really doesn't play defense either. I am concerned about the size of their offensive line. Washington center is 275 pounds. Michigan um, is a lot bigger and tougher and more physical. I thought it would be Bama and Washington as well. Clint, those were my picks. Uh, but I just have to say, Kalen DeBoer, as good of an offensive mind as there is in football, period, on any level. Uh, and Michael Penix Jr., quite frankly, he won't be, but because of the injuries, because he's left-handed, because of his size, but he is the best player in college football. Uh, they're 14 and 0, and you've got two 14 and 0 teams with Jim Harbaugh, which could be his last game, particularly if they win. Harbaugh's hired new representation on National Signing Day. There was a letter of new allegations against uh, Michigan and Jim Harbaugh. He missed the first three games of the season for. Uh, being less than truthful with the NCAA, he missed the last three games of the regular season due to the Connor Stallions uh, fiasco. And I think Jim Harbaugh looks at the, at the Los Angeles Chargers with their quarterback, their wide receiver situation, great players littered on that roster on offense and defense. Uh, he took the 49ers to the Super Bowl. And uh, Justin Herbert at quarterback is one of the top young quarterbacks in the NFL. I think he makes that move uh, if he can get it. It'll be interesting to see what the Stanos family does. They should have hired, they should have fired Staley two years ago <clears throat> when they missed out on the playoffs because he kept calling timeouts in that regular season game against the Raiders. Rich Basaccia, his final game as interim head coach, he was just going to let the clock run out. And it would have been then a tie. Both teams would have made the playoffs. Staley burns his timeouts, and he says, well, screw it. We'll just go for it. And the Raiders kick a field goal. Chargers don't make the playoffs. He should have been fired then. The guy is clearly a double-digit IQ individual. Then last year, they go to Jacksonville. They're up 28 to nothing at halftime and blow that game. Uh, they, he, they could have fired him. They could have hired Sean Payton. But they didn't. Now I think Jim Harbaugh, the obvious choice. But you on Monday night will get two 14 and 0 conference champions, Michigan and Washington, two contrasting styles of play. It'll be in Houston, the site of the Atlanta Falcons Super Bowl meltdown. And, uh, well, that's all I got to say about that. Should be a great game. Um, I'm pulling for Washington, but I think Michigan's going to win. And I love Jim Harbaugh, regardless of the controversy, regardless of the fact he's somewhere on the spectrum, just like Mike Leach and Steve Spurrier in all likelihood. And so we'll see what happens there. All right. So next year you got the 12-team playoff. And is it just me or is, are the bowl games, are they dead? Uh, I don't think it's sustainable. If you watch game day, I, I love the bowl games. But with the opt-outs, with the transfer portal, the ratings are going to suffer. I mean, I just went through some of the more notable bowl games Right, jump in the Nana's porch chat box at any time on this. But you know, Florida State 13 and 0, but no, they didn't deserve to be in the college football playoff. And no, take Rodham 
maker would not have lit uh, Alabama or Michigan. Okay, but FSU uh, with out 20 players and mostly their starting defense, their best players on offense, all gone 63-3. to three. USF, which sucked all year long. Okay, barely six and six. They beat Syracuse 45 to nothing. Syracuse moves on from Dino Babers. A ton of their players in the transfer portal, one of which South Carolina is trying to get. Uh, they were decimated. They lost 45 to nothing. Northwestern, they beat Utah because of transfers 14 to seven. West Virginia, 30, North Carolina, 10. You did not have Drake May. You did not have Tez Walker. You did not have a lot of other players for North Carolina. They get rung up by Neil Brown and West, by God, Virginia, 30 to 10. Ohio State, one of the top four teams all year long. They're starting quarterback. Hits the portal. Marvin Harrison Jr. opts out. A lot of other guys opt out. Guys hit the portal. They lose to Missouri 14 to 3. Notre Dame 40. Oregon State 8. Okay. Notre Dame would have been bulldozed by Oregon State in the regular season. But Oregon State's coach. Moves to Michigan State. A ton of guys hit the transfer portal. They've got a skeleton roster. Notre Dame, 40 to 8. Who wants to see that? I mean, now, at least with the 12-team playoff, those teams will probably have most all their players going into the playoff because they'll all have a chance to win a national championship. But I think, honestly, 16 teams is going to be inevitable because it's kind of flawed. Like, okay, the top four conference champions, not the top four overall seeds. Well, they are the top four overall seeds even though they won't be ranked one through four, they get a first round bye. Well, then teams that are not conference champions, like Notre Dame, who will never be a top four seed because they are not a conference champion, or you could have the number two or three overall seed, like an SEC or a Big Ten runner-up, They're going to be hosting a first round. They won't get to host a first round, or they will host a first round game, just like Notre Dame will, even though they didn't win their conference. And then these teams that win their conference, they're going to go to a neutral site to play a second round game. And so I think ultimately it'll go to 16, and the top eight seeds will all host first round games and then you'll use the bowls. And so what happens for everybody else? 12 or 16, regardless. So here's, here's my fix for it, okay? Uh, partly from Mike Farrell, partly from just my thoughts. If players opt out, they have to reimburse you for their room board and tuition and meals. Um, if they want to hit the transfer portal and you're going to a bowl game, if they don't play, they got to reimburse. Okay. If they don't play, they can't be on the sideline for the bowl game. If, if they're in the transfer portal or they're opting out, if they want to go down, they have to pay their own on their own dime. Okay, if you do away with the bowl games because you think it's unsustainable and because nobody's advertising for 
USF and Syracuse or Georgia 63 to 3 over Florida State or Notre Dame 40 to 8 over Oregon State or, you know, Appalachian State and James Madison, then I say this. Let's just give everybody 15 practices and let everybody play an exhibition game. And if you're South Carolina and you don't make a bowl game, maybe you want to schedule the best Big Ten team that doesn't make a bowl game. And you pitch it to the networks. They decide who hosts it. And everybody plays. And the best games get on TV. If you want to play Charleston Southern, then it's probably not going to be on TV. And then I say, in the spring, let every team have a closed spring game, not televised, against whoever they want to play. Just like in men's and women's basketball, they have the secret closed scrimmage. Let them have that as well. Or maybe you just say, well, no bowl game for you, but everybody in the spring, you can play a spring football game. So that's my fix for that. All right, moving on. The transfer portal, okay? I want Clint, Craig, and others chiming in. Today marks the beginning of the open transfer portal period. Teams that played in bowl games uh, on January 1st, their players have four days after January 1st. The two teams that play in the national championship on the 8th will have four days after that game for players to go in the portal. What's up, happy, happy, happy? Um, and so South Carolina, uh, since our last show, has lost three players uh, more to the transfer portal, bringing up, I believe it's now 21 scholarship players in the portal Starting linebacker Stone Blanton announced on December 27th he was hitting the transfer portal. Peace out, dude. Good luck at Mississippi State. Uh, you know, parents probably should not read message boards and social media. Um, a lot of people were very critical of Stone Blanton. Uh, I thought he was better. I thought he a bad situation, quite frankly, by Clayton White and because of the lack of depth. Uh, but he wasn't ready to be a starter. He was one of the worst starting linebackers in all of Power Five. Let's call it like it is. Other than the one play against uh, Jacksonville State, he really didn't make very many plays. Um, and then last night, Grayson Pup Howard, who told Shane Beamer 12 months ago he would die for the University of South Carolina in that football program. Um, he decides to transfer, as does Cameron Sandlin. Um, I think Pup, and I've said this, so I've got two or three thoughts. Number one, uh, JC will tell you this. Any national recruiting guy will tell you this. Jacksonville, there is a very high bust rate on four- and five-star players that come out of Jacksonville. Okay, there just is. There always has been. High school football is not very good in Duval County and in Jacksonville. And high school players, there's just a high bust rate. Pup Howard was not happy with his playing time. He thought he should have been playing more. Uh, I thought he probably should have been playing more. But he's too big to be an SEC linebacker. The fact is, he needed to talk to Melvin Ingram. Okay, Shane Beamer, 
Next time you sign a high school linebacker who's 6'3", 215, and by the time he gets on campus is 6'4", 245, you need to fly Melvin Ingram in and tell him to talk to this guy about transitioning to defensive end. You make more money in the National Football League, okay, and this guy was not Fred Warner. Okay, the inside linebacker for the 49ers. That is the kind of dude you've got to have if you're going to be that big. Pup Howard was always destined to be either a hand in the dirt, edge rusher, or a guy that was a buck or a jack linebacker, which quite frankly I thought he could have been in South Carolina's 3-4 or 335 system, just like Kalimba Edwards was. Okay. Um, but not as good as Dylan Stewart. Not as explosive as Dylan Stewart. Not as explosive as Kyle Kennard. Not as explosive as JT Gear, who I think once you, you he's he's healthy now. In the spring, you'll see a different player. Uh, Wendell Gregory, uh, quick twitch, bigger outside, inside linebacker that could play in the box or play outside the same with Fred J.R. Johnson. Both of these guys, uh, quite frankly, are quicker and faster than Pup Howard or Stone Blanton. South Carolina is looking to upgrade by bringing in faster, speedier guys out of the portal. Clint, I do agree. I think Sandlin could have had some Jaheim Bell in him. But I think Michael Smith is a bigger version of that. Um, you know, there's a lot of guys at uh, tight end. Pup, yes, Carolina Titan Pup was the guy that said he wanted people that wanted to be at South Carolina and that he would die for South Carolina. So, uh, South Carolina, if you look at it, now you're losing Stone Blanton, who's a starter. You lost Jalen Nichols, who would have been a starter. Uh, Juice Wells, who would have been a starter. And... Mitch Jeter, okay. Uh, Sandlin has already been replaced, okay. I think South Carolina with Brady Cook, who I think is going to be a freak, and Michael Smith, along with the guys that they signed last year, I like what they've done at tight end, okay. Here's another thing. College football has changed forever. Now you can transfer multiple times. Every season has to be about that season. Now I will say this. It was a bad look for Shane Beamer to lose Pup Howard. Okay. When you signed him, you stood up and gushed about him how he was a future captain, was going to be a cornerstone of your program. He was the lead recruiter in that class because you didn't have a quarterback committed until National Signing Day uh, when you got Lenora Sellers. And so he led the charge. He was your culture guy. Okay, but he wasn't happy. He thought he should play more. He was homesick. Homesick. Come on, man. Jacksonville's four and a half hours from Columbia. Okay, be a man. All right, how many times did Pup Howard make that drive from Jacksonville to Columbia and back? Okay, grow up. Okay, grow a pair. Be a man. Act like a man, okay? Nobody's a man of their word anymore. 
everybody's flipping. They're committing to three or four different schools. Coaches are mercenaries. Now players are mercenaries. Okay. Shane Beamer's got to adjust. You have to bring in more support staff. You need to have an entire scouting department where you're scouting group of five schools and power five schools all season long for players that potentially could go in the portal or that you're hoping goes in the portal. And so college football's changed. Gone are the days of red shirting. Why am I red shirting a guy? Okay. Is he, am I really betting that he's going to stay at my school for five years or four years? I don't think so. College football is a year to year business now for everybody except the blue bloods. And if you're South Carolina, you've got to embrace it. You've got to come up with the money in the collectives to be able to restock every single year. Now, I do agree. There needs to be a salary cap and regulation. Um, but the NCAA, as currently constructed, cannot enforce it because they do not have subpoena power. Okay, it is going to take an act of Congress, literally or physically or figuratively, for this to change because guys are going to continue to get bags under the table. It's prevalent in recruiting, which it was never meant to be. But if you're South Carolina, all you can count on is one season from every player on your roster. That's all you can count on. I mean, maybe the in-state guys, okay, which there are not enough of in a small state, you can count on them, the guys that are closer, um, and the guys that truly are being taken care of through name, image, and likeness. But even then, look at Dylan Gabriel at Oklahoma. Look at Ohio State's quarterback. Look at all the four and five stars at Georgia. Players from Alabama bailing immediately. Okay. I'm not red shirting anybody. If I got a great athlete, they're playing on special teams. Okay. Quarterbacks, I'm playing. You just can't count on them. You can't. It's a brave new world, and Shane Beamer has got to adjust and figure it out because it's not like what he knew growing up with his dad, okay? You're not getting six years to have a winning record, okay? Mike Brown, if he was in his first tenure at North Carolina and he went 2-10 and 10 or 1-11 two years in a row, he would not get year three. Okay, instead he built it into a powerhouse, just like Frank Beamer built Virginia Tech. Um, Craig, I mean, I agree, but the bottom line is uh, you saw Tennessee's uh, $11 million quarterback in action, and uh, next year, if he has a good year and Tennessee's not, in the college football playoff, uh, his last name, I am Oliva. Okay, he will be a leaving to go to a newer, higher paying program. That's just the facts. So, Gamecocks, eight players in, 21 scholarship players, and 22 out. Today, there are at least four players who are on campus for official visits. South Carolina looking for wide receivers, a quarterback, offensive linemen, linebackers, and a corner. Okay, to me, they need another 
they need a cornerback one. They need wide receiver one. All right, so there will be players visiting every day this week. Today, Louisville wide receiver, um, Amari Huggins-Bruce, 5'11", 170, a native of Dillon. He visits South Carolina. I anticipate him committing on his visit. And I anticipate him being a serious upgrade to Jaden McGowan's. Okay. You look back on his career at Louisville. This was a guy, he's got to be really good because Brian McClendon didn't want him. I mean, look at the list is long and distinguished of guys Brian McClendon did not want, okay, um, including Jalen Hyatt, who was a Bolitnikoff winner, okay. Let's just call it like it is. D-Mac sucked as an evaluator and as a wide receiver coach. Amari Huggins-Bruce in 2021 as a true freshman, 29 catches, 444 yards, 15.3 yards per catch, four touchdowns. Last season, 31 receptions. Uh, in 2022, 365 yards, three touchdowns. A new coaching staff comes in. His, rule is, his role is reduced under Jeff Brom, but still 20 receptions, 312 yards, 15.6 yards per carry, four touchdowns. He's sub 4-4 in the 40. Southern Cal, Texas A&M, both offered – Wanted him to visit many other Power Five offers for Amari Huggins Bruce. I like him. I think he will be productive. And guess what? He's from South Carolina. This is going to be a guy that's going to lay it all on the line. Okay. Also, visiting today is linebacker Demetrius Knight, 6'2. 247 pounds, quick, fast, and athletic this past season at Charlotte. 96 tackles, five and a half tackles for loss, one sack. Transferred to Charlotte after playing three years at Georgia Tech. 51 total tackles in 36 games, three tackles for loss. He is a guy that, at worst, is a guy that can play 20 snaps a game so Debo Williams is not having to play 80-something plays a game, okay? You can't do that. Plus, I like some of the other guys as well. Two offensive linemen on campus today. That is Houston offensive tackle, Ruben Unige, 6'5", 310. He played at IMG Academy. He signed with Illinois over South Carolina. Only stayed at Illinois for one year. Went to JUCO, bounced back to Houston. Has started at left tackle and right tackle. This past season started all 11 games in which he played at offensive tackle, he is on campus, as well as a dude that I think could make an immediate impact. It was an FCS All-American at North Carolina A&T. He's been coached by former Gamecock Cedric Williams. Okay, Torricelli Simpkins the third, 6'5", 320 can play center or guard, uber athletic. Go turn on the film. He can pull. He led them in uh, pancake blocks. Okay, 35 career starts. Hell, this guy started as a true freshman in the MEAC. He's big. He's athletic. He can pull. Two years in a row, first team all MEAC. And a guy that this past season 
was HBCU first team All-American, third team FCS All-American, first team All-MEAC, average seven pancake blocks per game, and graded out at 85%. And there it is, no shock, Montario 420 Hardesty has been relieved of his duties, and uh, this is only the first of several coaching changes to come. I knew you were not going to let Monterio Hardesty coach Rocket Sanders, uh, Oscar Attaway the third, Juwan Howell, Matthew Fuller, and DJ Braswell. He had to go. Uh, South Carolina will make a massive upgrade at this position. So that is breaking news here at 1.40 Eastern time on Wednesday. And so here's the deal. Why is it waiting, taking so long? And I was going to mention this as it pertains to the dead period in the transfer portal. So South Carolina's finished with running back. Okay, they've signed all of them, all of them enrolled today, except for Matthew Fuller. He's signed and sealed. He's coming in this summer. I would certainly think Jimmy Smith could be a guy, but I would not rule out another big-time coach that Shane Beamer has worked with in the past. Okay, South Carolina is going to make a tremendous hire here. It's just a matter of time. Um, maybe today will be the beginning, but I would think uh, at the positions where you're trying to acquire talent, on the defensive side of the ball, okay, your offensive line coach, your wide receivers coach, those guys probably aren't going anywhere, okay? Um Will Clayton White be retained ultimately? I've heard it both ways. Uh, but I do know this. Shane Beamer's superiors are expecting significant changes on this coaching staff. Um, that has been the directive. And as my friend Tony Morella said, this is an inflection point for Clayton White. Or, or, or I'm sorry, for Shane Beamer. Do you, is Clayton White a guy that can get you to the college football playoff? Is he a guy that can navigate the transfer portal? Is he a guy that can develop players? Okay, are we going to go based on just Vanderbilt, Kentucky, and Clemson, who were three bad offensive teams? Or are we going to look at Jacksonville State running you up and down the field? Florida, who sucked out loud, absolutely putting a beat down on you. Graham Mertz having a career day, and you can't get a wide receiver on fourth down on the ground twice, let alone slow Florida down and give up almost 500 yards to them? At home, you waste Spencer Rattler, okay, and Xavier Leggett and the big-time season they had. Is Clayton White the guy? Okay. Um, I do know they are hiring a linebackers coach. You can count on that coming. There's going to be more changes on offense. But this is an inflection point for Shane Beamer because – your offensive and defensive systems and your special teams now, you have to simplify because of the transfer portal. It is one and done is the way you have to look at it. You have to scale it down, okay? And part of the reason why Pup Howard and others did not get on the field was because of the complexity of Clayton White's defense. Okay, guys could not get on the field like Jaron Willis. 
like Bam Martin Scott. Because of how complex it was. Then you simplify, you go to three, three, five, and those guys look great. It's the reason why Pup Howard didn't play. And he enrolled and went through bowl practice and all of spring practice. But again, he was always destined to move to an edge or a buck or a jack roll, bottom line. So um, I would anticipate Shane Beamer having all hands on deck through the 7th, the 8th through the 12th is a dead period. That is the coaches convention. There are guys whose contracts are out. They uh, have run out that may not be renewed. There are guys that have contracts just like Montario Hardesty, who not only did you extend his contract, you gave him a raise. God almighty, what in the world convinced you to do that when you could have gotten Jimmy Smith last year and maybe had Rocket Sanders for two years instead of one? Um, so I would expect more changes next over the, over the course of this week and over the course of next week, because when the recruiting period opens up, South Carolina is still going to be in business for portal guys who can come in before the last day of drop ad. And you're going to really want to hit the road running, uh, with junior recruiting and, you want to see if you can scour the high schools and maybe find uh, one or two guys that kind of got lost in the shuffle of the transfer portal, coaching changes, uh, and guys that did not sign or guys that you can, you know, think you can bring in and develop. So we will um, see what happens there. Um, Matt Brown parted ways with Gene Chiswick. I think Chiswick's always wanted to coach, but at the same time has had one foot out because of his family. And Brian Kelly today fired his entire defensive staff. So, hey, Jimmy Lindsey, good luck with that. Uh, their coordinator got fired. Everybody got fired except the guy that was an analyst who wound up covering for Jimmy Lindsay until he uh, was able to coach. So that's the first change. There will be more uh, coaching changes. We will be following that. And so as I said, at least four um, transfer portal guys today. And I think South Carolina with the departure of Nick Gargiulo, you could move uh, Big Tree Babalade inside if you find a left tackle. But I love... Um, Torricelli Simpkins. He is a big, athletic, quick, heavy-handed dude that can pull. He can play center. He can play guard. And he's essentially started every single game for three years for a team that knocked off uh, Deion Sanders last year at Colorado. Okay. All right. So, Clint, um, Ruben Unige from Houston and Torricelli Simpkins III, a native of Charlotte, Olympia High School. He is 6'5", 320, and he looks like an NFL player. 
And you can say, yes, he's FCS. Uh, North Carolina A and or North Carolina Central has been one of the premier uh, FCS and HBCU programs. Cedric Williams, former Gamecock, uh, coached him at North Carolina Central, and he is a stud. Uh, Ruben Unige would be transferring from Houston. Torricelli Simpkins transferring from North Carolina Central. Uh, obviously a Teasley connection, but he's also a Charlotte guy and was a guy that they identified because you got to replace at least one guard. Okay, you are replacing one guard because Nick Gargiulo is leaving. You've got positional versatility. With Vershawn Lee, you really don't want to play him at tackle. He's a center or a guard. And so you bring in Torricelli, who is a taller, bigger dude than Vershawn Lee. And uh, to me, those are the two guys that are in today. Uh, four guys total, one wide receiver, one linebacker, two offensive linemen. That we know of. Okay, let me call it like I see it here. A lot of guys, the staff does not want to know, but they don't want the public to know they're coming in. Like, we know Elijah Surratt, who is a guy that's capable of being a wide receiver one, is coming in later this week. I think it'll be South Carolina or Indiana for him. His former coach is at Indiana, Okay, Kirk Signetti, um, he's 6'2", two, two, about 210. He is. He looks very good. There's no doubt about it. Um, Gage uh, Larvadane was the max leading receiver. He is a jet quick guy, 5'10", uh, 5'11", one year. Uh Jabari Barber from Troy. He's a smaller, quick twitch guy. Uh, very productive at Troy. He's coming in later this year. There's also a guy that probably will not be in the portal until the spring. He will be a graduate transfer that I would project South Carolina to land. Uh no name on that because obviously a lot can change. But every day this week, today is Wednesday the 3rd, tomorrow the 4th, okay, guys will be in, okay. Bangeli Kamar, the linebacker from Pitt, 6'2", 230, who's a two-year starter at Pitt, he will be in. 21 starts over the last two years. To me, he's definitely a starter for you at linebacker, plug and play, okay? I think the Gamecocks feel good about their standing with uh, Larva Dane and Surratt, but you got to hope if that Surratt survives, you survive that Indiana visit, okay, or you move him up and you get him in first. I think he's not scheduled to visit until this weekend. Okay, uh, you've got another linebacker scheduled to visit from uh, Mississippi State, 6'3", 231 pounds. He's coming in. He's got two years to play. Okay, he's primarily been a special teams player at – Arkansas, but he's played on all four special teams unit. Manny Powell, 6'3", 231. He's a guy that can come in and be a backup. Okay. We haven't even talked about the nine guys in this class that are at All-America games. Okay. You have got seven signees at the Under Armour 
game. Here's I get my notes. Okay. And uh, two guys that are in San Antonio. So you've got Dante Reno. You've got DeBron Gatling, who's really flashed. He is a guy that's a mid-year guy that I believe will make an impact at South Carolina. Tied in Michael Smith. Okay. He's a freak. He's one of the only guys that won't be coming in mid-year. You've got Cam Pringle, who's down there, who will not play in the game today. Uh, you've got Dylan Stewart, who's been the alpha dog, uh, maybe the most physically gifted guy in Orlando at that game. He is a major impact guy. Okay, you've got Wendell Gregory, an outside linebacker, a guy that could play in the box or be an edge guy that is super talented. Okay, you've also got Jalewis Solomon, uh, who the staff believes could be a day one starter. And you've got your kicker, punter, Mason Love there. Okay, then you go to San Antonio and you've got five-star offensive tackle Josiah Thompson who will enroll next week, who will be 295, 300 pounds by the season. Uh, don't sleep on this guy being a day one starter, okay? He handled L.J. McCray, who's a five-star that's going to Florida, and he stonewalled that guy, okay? Um, he's down there. So is Fred J.R. Johnson, who was the 5A Virginia Defensive Player of the Year. He was All-State as a tight end and as a linebacker, 6'4", 225, He's a guy, he and Wendell Gregory both remind me of Fred Warner who plays for the 49ers. These guys, these are the kind of guys you want at linebacker, okay? Could they grow into an edge? Maybe. Wendell Gregory, if he's 6'2", 225, probably a guy that stays as a will linebacker, okay? But also a guy that could give you great – uh, quick twitch, pass rush ability. Fred J.R. Johnson, he's a guy that could probably carry 240 plus pounds and play inside because of just how athletic he is. He's probably the most underrated guy in the class. You know, look, don't count out Mazio Bennett and DeBron Gatlin, guys. I'm just telling you. Both of these guys are high floor guys and guys that will be developed by Justin Stapp because that is the best thing that he does. Uh, Johnson can play tight end, Craig, but I'm just telling you, he is too good on defense. I mean, he came out of nowhere because he had been a wide receiver, grew, got bigger, also played defense and was an absolute stud, led Maury to the state championship game in 5A in the state of Virginia, uh, in the 757, just a big time pickup. And so this is a very talented freshman class. And look, you're going to play the majority of these guys. Okay. I do agree on the offensive line. You're going to see Marquis Anderson. You're going to see Trevon Ball. Okay. You're going to see uh, guys like Rashawn Lee. Uh, if South Carolina lands these two portal offensive linemen, which I would be shocked if they don't land at least one of them, if not both of them, they have more offensive linemen visiting during the week. The big offensive tackle from Mississippi State, I've heard South Carolina – 
feels really good about him. 6'8", 345 pounds. Don't count them out for him. Um, also, don't count the Gamecocks out on the defensive line. Okay, they could look to add additional edge rushers or a tackle in the portal. I just heard from a source they felt pretty good about him. I mean, look, you can never count out the portal king, but my God, how are they not tapped out of money right now at Ole Miss with, you know, Walter Nolan and some of those other dudes they brought in? So, we will see. Uh, I do think South Carolina loves the two guys that are in today, and a bird in the hand is better than two in the bush. But I would say that um, no doubt about it, you're going to add as many as you can because next year is not guaranteed, okay? If you can bring in guys now because you're going to have the room, more guys will leave in the spring, okay? No doubt about that, all right? No doubt about that. You've got 21 out. You've only got eight in. You're going to add – you're looking to add at least three more wide receivers, one quarterback. That would be 12 in. Uh, two to three linebackers. If you got three, that would be 15 in. If you add – a cornerback or a defensive back, that could be 16 or 17 in. Okay, maybe you add two quarterbacks. So you're looking at filling up most of those empty spots, and then more guys are going to leave after spring. So uh, you have got to be ready and poised to strike in the portal. Caden Salter, South Carolina, did recruit him out of high school. Okay, he uh, was going to, I think, Baylor. And they, they uh, Matt Rule came in and cut everybody loose. So, um, yeah, Clint, I mean, no doubt. J.R. Johnson is good of an athlete as is in this class. Uh, no doubt about it. Uh, Craig saying Pup saw the writing on the wall. I mean, look, you can kind of read between the lines, but this guy was not going to be an impact inside linebacker. Okay, he was a developmental player. Okay, he was probably best suited for the edge. I don't think he wanted to play there. I got bad news for him. Billy Napier is getting fired next year. And whoever's Florida's coach, if he's 250 pounds, they're going to move him to defensive end. Is he going to transfer to Central Florida or USF at that point because he still wants to be a linebacker? I don't know. Okay. Tate Rodemaker, I would say, is the player South Carolina's in the best shape for at quarterback. He is from Valdosta, Georgia. Okay. Um, Craig, they're going to look to add three portal guys. Okay. In addition to Jared Brown. They will probably take another guy because you just look at all the attrition. Okay, not only are you losing Juice Wells, not only are you losing Xavier Leggett, I mean, almost everybody else is gone except the guys that were true freshmen. Okay, Tyshawn Russell, I think he's got a high upside. Kelton Henderson may be a DB. Honestly, I think you should probably switch him and Bakari Swain. I still say Swain is the most natural and the best high school wide receiver Shane Beamer has signed during his tenure at South Carolina. Um, C.J. Adams, we didn't see anything from him. Nicholas Harbor, is he really a wide receiver? I don't know. 
Uh, cocky talk. I don't think Shane Beamer named a replacement today, but it may not be long until uh, he has somebody in place because I can promise you this. Shane Beamer has known since before the Kentucky game, changes were coming. And he has uh, been mining and biding his time and working behind the scenes, okay, uh, to line up coaches to take uh, these guys' positions that either their staff that their contract's running out or that they are going to um, replace. I agree it sucks to pay that guy 400000 more dollars, which mostly will probably go to a marijuana dispensary somewhere. Um, uh, Clint, I would say you would want all your coaches in place by the time the recruiting period starts back up in January. Okay. The, the, the dead period starts on Sunday. That's the last day visits can take place. The eighth through the 12th, that entire week is a dead period. That's the, uh, American football coaches, uh, national conference okay that will be in houston and then on the 13th you can start bringing guys back in for visits that'll be the last weekend until the dead period or, or until uh the deadline the last day for drop ad run uh runs out so south carolina most certainly will be trying to bring guys in all this week and then uh, the 13th and 14th and then in the days uh, that follow that leading up to the last day for drop ad which I think is either the 16th or the 18th this year because um, you want to bring in as many guys as you can before spring practice so that they can go through spring and uh, learn the system um so we will see what happens next man what a huge show look titan i agree uh harbor to me if you're south carolina you want to encourage his hopes and dreams okay but if he does not make that olympic team he needs to rush the passer you can tell him he can still run track okay he can Stay. Uh, look, I stood next to the guy on the sideline. He's 6'6", six, six plus 250 pounds right now. He is a freak of an athlete. I mean, he looked really scary to me. He looked like that dude in Predator, okay? I mean, I just think that's his best position. I think you got to bring in Melvin Ingram, Jadevi and Clowney, bring in some guys across the country that started out on offense that wound up being first round picks on defense and uh, let him know how much money he can make. I mean, look at Jadevi and Clowney. He's finally healthy again. He's having a banner year and he may get a Super Bowl ring. Okay. As of today, you can't tell me it's not Baltimore and the 49ers are not the favorites to reach the Super Bowl. Um, so it will be interesting to see uh, what happens this week. I'll be back tomorrow and Friday. I'll be mining the transfer portal. If we have to have an emergency rapid reaction on guys committing over the weekend, tune in to Gamecock Pod daily. Follow me on Twitter, at KAllSep. Follow the show, uh, at Gamecock Pod. Sign up. Become a member. If you would like more of this every single day, Monday through Friday, okay, 
and we have the morning after. We're going to have a weekend wrap-up podcast for basketball every single weekend, okay? Sign up on our Patreon page. You can get a month's worth of podcasts, including the Garnet Black Town Hall, which we're not having this week. Um, but next week, that will resume on Tuesday, January the 9th. The night after the national championship, we'll have a better handle on the transfer portal, the guys that they bring in this week and through the weekend before the dead period, where they stand, what's left. We'll have a lot of that, the best basketball coverage, okay, women's basketball, men's basketball that's around on a daily basis. You can – Get all of that plus the Garnet Black Town Hall, which Clint and others can tell you is outstanding. It's a weekly Zoom call where we record it for an hour for our VIP members that can't join live. But then for the 75 to 100 people that do tune in, we go to overtime. That's where the real scoop is dropped. That's where everybody jumps in. Robert knows. Clint knows. Okay, I'm looking forward to seeing everybody next Tuesday night in the Garnet Black Town Hall. We didn't even get to our interview with Peyton Titus from Go Gamecocks today. We will bring you that in podcast form, and I'll be back tomorrow. So this is Keith Alsep, and this has been Gamecock Pod Live for January the 3rd. If commitments break, rapid reactions could follow. Guys, thanks to everybody that joined in today. Thanks to everybody jumping in the chat box, to Craig, to Robert, to Titan, to Clint, to Cocky Talk, to my main dude, Arthur. Got to get you back on the pod. Hit me up in my DMs. Let's get on that. And to everybody else, until tomorrow, this has been Gamecock Pod Live. God bless and go Gamecocks. I'm out of here.